Greetings, good morning, good afternoon and evening, everyone. I wanna extend a warm welcome to all of you, wherever you are joining from around the world. Thank you for making time to hear from our honorable guests and speakers about the incredible role that peatlands play in supporting biodiversity, conservation, and in turn, human health and well-being. Our session today is entitled Peatlands as a Super Nature-Based Solutions to Climate Change and a Refuge for Unique and Threatened Biodiversity. And this session builds upon the Global Peatlands Initiative Partnership, which is coordinated by UNEP and it consists of more than 35 partners in four tropical peatland countries, Indonesia, Peru, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo and the Republic of Congo. The initiative aims to promote the conservation, restoration, and sustainable management of peatlands globally as part of the International Climate Initiative supported by Germany's Federal Ministry of Environment, uh, Nature Conservation, and Nuclear Safety. The session is structured around a journey across multiple continents, highlighting the role of peatlands, their status, and their future through a variety of case studies and experiences. The emphasis of this session builds on the important work which has been presented in UNEP's Wild for Life campaign and also forms an important input into the recently launched UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration, which we are so excited about. We hope you'll enjoy hearing hands-on experience from the incredible presenters today. If you have any questions, I wanna encourage you to post them in the chat and our team will be monitoring these in English, Spanish, and French to compile them for response at the end of the speaker session during our question and answer session. I'd like also to share that there's real-time translation services that are available for the session through the uh, Interactio app. It can be accessed via the GLF website for this session. Please do not hesitate to reach out to the GLF team for any technical issues that you have. And it's now my distinct pleasure to welcome our incredible and distinguished speakers um, who I'll introduce as we go through this special peatlands journey together. Uh, the first session is on global peatlands health and planetary health are connected. Um, and it's a great honor to uh, present the Minister of Tourism and Environment from the Republic of Congo, who will be speaking on peatlands and biodiversity uh, in Central Africa and for the globe. Uh, Minister Sadanua, you have the floor. Merci, uh, uh, Suzanne, for ces mots gentils en introduction. Monsieur le vice-ministre de l'Indonésie, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants de l'ONU Environnement, Mesdames et Messieurs les représentants des partenaires techniques et financiers, distingués participants, Mesdames et Messieurs. Je tiens tout d'abord à remercier les organisateurs de, ce, de cet événement pour avoir bien voulu m'associer en ma qualité de ministre du Tourisme et de l'Environnement en charge des questions de développement durable de la République du Congo. Le thème du présent forum, qui porte sur les tourbières, nous interpelle à plus d'un titre à l'heure où les solutions basées sur la nature ont été identifiées comme un moyen efficace pour lutter contre les changements climatiques Dans la, perspective, dans la perspective de l'atteinte des objectifs de l'accord de Paris sur le climat. Comme vous le savez, les tourbières de la cuvette centrale du bassin du Congo ont été mises en évidence grâce aux travaux de recherche du professeur Simon Davis de l'Université de Leeds, dont les résultats ont été publiés dans la revue Nature en 2017. Ces recherches ont révélé l'existence dans la cuvette centrale du bassin du Congo de tourbières s'étendant à ce jour sur 145 500 km² et qui séquestrent 
près de 30 milliards de tonnes de carbone. Ce chiffre représente environ trois ans d'émissions de CO2 de toute la planète. La découverte des tourbières au cœur du bassin du Congo, deuxième poumon écologique de la planète après l'Amazonie, place la République du Congo, mon pays, devant un double défi, celui de participer activement à la préservation des 228 millions d'hectares de forêts du bassin, mais également à la gestion durable de cette véritable bombe à retardement que, re que représentent ces tourbières. Parce que nous ne l'oublions pas, les tourbières, c'est 200% de la biomasse des forêts. Il apparaît en effet aujourd'hui évident que nous pouvons sérieusement compromettre l'atteinte des objectifs de l'accord de Paris sur le climat, cet énorme puits de carbone, si cet énorme puits de carbone n'est pas géré de manière durable. La République du Congo a pris très tôt la mesure de cette responsabilité historique et s'est lancée dans plusieurs initiatives pour une gestion durable de cet écosystème particulier et fragile qui abrite une biodiversité riche et variée. Mesdames et messieurs, c'est le lieu ici de rappeler la tenue à Brazzaville en mars 2018 de la troisième réunion des partenaires de l'initiative mondiale sur les tourbières, à l'issue de laquelle a été signée la déclaration de Brazzaville entre la République du Congo, la République démocratique du Congo et l'Indonésie pour une gestion durable des tourbières. Nous avons aussi conclu en 2019, un mémorandum d'entente avec l'Indonésie dans l'objectif du renforcement de la coopération Sud-Sud pour un échange d'expériences et de bonnes pratiques dans la gestion durable des tourbières tropicales. Enfin, un cadre institutionnel pour la gestion des tourbières est en cours de préparation au niveau national et la problématique des tourbières a été prise en compte dans la lettre d'intention qui a été signée entre notre pays et l'initiative pour les forêts d'Afrique centrale, le CAFI. Actuellement, deux projets importants sont en cours de préparation, notamment le Fonds mondial pour l'environnement. Il s'agit avec le Fonds, notamment avec le Fonds mondial pour l'environnement, il s'agit là de la conservation intégrée des écosystèmes de tourbières à base communautaire et promotion de l'écotourisme et de la protection de la biodiversité, du carbone et des réserves d'eau dans les tourbières du bassin du Congo, avec l'appui du fonds allemand IKI. Il sied également de noter que le professeur Simon Levis et ses équipes ont lancé en 2019 la deuxième phase du projet Congo Pit 2. À ce stade, ces recherches ont permis de relever que les tourbières de la République du Congo sont irriguées grâce aux eaux des pluies, contrairement à celles de la République démocratique du Congo, qui sont irriguées par les cours d'eau. Cette découverte implique, pour la République du Congo, mon pays, l'impérieuse nécessité de lutter efficacement contre la déforestation dans la zone des tourbières au risque de les assécher et de préserver la biodiversité unique dont elle regorge. Donc, il nous faut, vous l'avez compris, impérativement trouver une économie alternative pour les populations riveraines, les communautés qui y vivent. Parce que nos tourbières, la différence avec celle de la RDC, sont irriguées, restent humides dans ces zones Ramsar à cause de la pluviométrie. Si nous coupons les arbres, eh ben, il ne pleuvra plus, pour dire tout simplement les choses. Mesdames et messieurs, la lutte contre les changements climatiques est un combat mondial qui ne se gagnera pas sans une gestion durable des tourbières, leur préservation faisant partie intégrante des solutions basées sur la nature. C'est pourquoi nous avons connu, c'est pourquoi nous avons convenu avec le Fonds vert pour le climat, le Fonds mondial pour l'environnement et le Fonds bleu pour le bassin du Congo 
de syndiquer, de fusionner ces fonds pour gérer durablement nos tourbières. Cette annonce se fera, sera faite solennellement à l'occasion du One Planet Summit qui se tiendra le 11 janvier 2021 à Marseille, si les conditions le permettent, parce que nous sommes en pleine pandémie encore que nous gérons euh, sur le plan de, de la COVID-19 en France et ailleurs dans le monde. Donc, si cela ne se fait pas en présentiel, cela se fera par visioconférence. Mais là, nous annonçons donc solennellement euh, euh, que ces trois fonds vont s'indiquer. Plus que jamais, nous avons donc besoin de l'appui de tous pour gérer durablement les tourbières qui sont aujourd'hui un bien commun de l'humanité. J'insiste, c'est un bien commun de l'humanité, c'est une bombe à retardement. Et, la, et donc la catastrophe que pourrait engendrer leur destruction aurait pour la planète tout entière des conséquences incalculables. Votre solidarité nous est donc indispensable. Voilà à peu près le message que j'aurais voulu, que j'ai délivré euh, 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 à l'endroit de tous, hein, qu'il nous faut donc préserver, préserver euh, euh, urgemment cette bombe à retardement qui sont donc ces tourbières de la cuvette centrale que nous partageons donc avec la République démocratique du Congo. Je vous remercie pour votre aimable attention. Thank you so much, Minister. It took a it took a bit of time for the translation to catch up with your with your rich statement and your strong message of importance. Good. I'm about... knowing. I'm knowing. <laughs> <laughs> well, tremendous, <laughs> tremendous message. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, thank you. And now I can. I, I'm good now. Okay. And thank you. Thank you. And uh, beautiful. Thank you for everybody. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm going now. I'm going. I'm. 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 Sorry. Perfect. Sorry. I'm going now, and I'm saying thank you in the help of all the is here, and I'm saying thank you, thank you for this possibility to change with all people who has here now. Thank you. Extraordinary. Extraordinary. Our appreciation. The next speaker is the Executive Secretary of the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species and Wild Animals. Uh, Executive Secretary Amy Frankel will be speaking on the global connectivity, why peatlands here matter there. Thank you, Amy. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, and to all who have organized this uh, very excellent uh, 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 event. We're very pleased from the Convention on Migratory Species to join. Uh, so let me uh, try to turn my slides on. We're all getting used to uh, how to do this. Let's see. Okay. Okay. So, uh, Susan, can you just confirm that uh, you can see the slides and you can hear me? I can hear you well, and we're waiting for the slides to come up. Okay. Okay, I've, I've shared the screen. Okay, I'll try one more time. I can see you and the beautiful background. Uh, I think here we have it. There it is, thank you. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Good. Okay, here we go. Uh, so uh, the title of our presentation and the title of this uh, entire session is, is very pertinent to the work that we're doing at the Convention of Migratory Species. And as you can see from our title, it's about the connectivity. What is the role of peatlands, uh, not only in one place, but 
thousands of miles away for uh, the livelihoods, the, the survival of migratory species and the habitats and the people around them. So first let me do one slide on what is the CMS. Our, our full name is actually the Convention on the Conservation of Migratory Species of Wild Animals. And there's a few important words in there, including migratory. For us, migratory uh, doesn't necessarily mean animals that go uh, thousands of miles away, although we have some that do, but it can also be, as, as you'll see in a moment, animals that routinely cross a border. And uh, the basis for our, our work is, is that, is international cooperation between two or more countries uh, for the conservation of shared migratory species, a shared range of those species and their habitats. Uh, so that lays the foundation for our work. Now, I wanna just also introduce this concept of connectivity. Uh, so connectivity is a concept that we've had quite a few experts, including there's an expert group of the IUCN uh, with hundreds, I think it's over 800 members um, that worked with us as well as uh, parties and uh, NGOs and other partners of the CMS over last year to better define what we're talking about here. So we came up with this working definition that was endorsed in fact by our Conference of the Parties this year at our 13th Conference of the Parties uh, meeting in, in India. You'll see on the screen, the working definition describes the unimpeded movement of species as well as the flow of natural processes that sustain life on earth. So this includes not just the movement of species, but also, for example, the movement of the water systems that are needed uh, to support them. Now, connectivity is absolutely essential for the survival of migratory species, but it's also quite relevant uh, to other mandates, to other priorities. For example, um, the UN Convention on uh, to Combat Desertification strongly supports and is a partner with us uh, in bringing forward this idea that we need to look at connected ecosystems and I'll explain what that means in, in a moment. Uh, but the third bullet here is very important. Uh, it embodies not only the natural patterns and the life cycles of migratory species, it also is a very helpful concept uh, and provides a roadmap for action in mixed use areas. And, and by that, I mean areas that are not pristine. They could be areas of human use, farming uh, or other uses, but yet they provide a very important say stop oversight for migratory species. And third, it's a very important uh, concept for uh, the foundation for countries to work together to say, uh, we need to share our commitment to address this ecosystem and these species that are connected between our, our countries. So I'm gonna show one slide, which is you know, sort of the bad news um, that I'm sure you're, you're all familiar with. And this is some of the key findings of the report last year from IPBAS, the Global Assessment on Biodiversity. And one of the headline uh, points that came out of that report is the first point here that a million species are facing extinction. Now about half of those are insects. It's very important to note, but uh, the other half are, are non-insect species, including migratory species, uh, some, some migratory species. So species are at risk. We're also losing a lot of, we've already lost uh, a lot of our land surface, altered it, altered the oceans, uh, impacting our oceans, and also 85% of wetlands have been lost. So we're not heading in the right direction um, with this, uh, these statistics. Importantly, the, the IPIS report found that area-based measures like protected areas have accomplished some uh, successes for example, you know, there's a lot more area uh, that's protected, but that they don't uh, protect, first of all, the right diversity of ecosystems. And second of all, they have not addressed this issue of connectivity adequately. So now let me move to peatlands. And I, I am not a peatlands expert. You have plenty of those who will be speaking today, uh, but I wanna point out the connection with migratory species, which is, the very diverse range of, of uh, peatlands are also important for supporting a diversity of migratory species. 
And they do it in several different ways. So I'll give you a few examples. First, if we take some species, their primary habitat is actually in peatlands. Uh, so peat swamp forests such as gorillas, chimpanzees, the forest African elephant, as well as the jaguar, which in fact was just listed on uh, CMS, uh, our appendices, which means that it needs protection under the CMS at our recent COP. Uh, the jaguar is a great example of, of connectivity uh, because its original range was from Argentina all the way up to the Southern United States. And so now we're really working with uh, the countries where the range uh, uh, exists to try and partners to uh, restore and can protect the connectivity for that uh, species. Now peat swamp forests uh, are becoming increasingly fragmented and so we're doing a lot of work uh, on the species that you see, as well as others that uh, really depend for their core habitat on peatlands. There's also uh, a, another uh, type of migratory species that relies on peatlands might rely on them just for part of the year, part of their seasonal migration. And these, of course, uh, are commonly some of the bird species that are protected under the convention. And just to give you uh, two example, uh, examples here, the Siberian crane, and, and they're a little different in terms of what's happening. So the Siberian crane, you see the two historical ranges, uh, one on the west and then more uh, in East, East Asia. Uh, really the only viable population left is on the east. Um, now here they rely on peatlands for their breeding grounds, but in the case of this species, it's not the breeding ground so much as the non-breeding areas, which are to the south, uh, like along the uh, Yangtze River Basin that is under threat because of changing habitat. But they are an example species that need peatlands to survive, but are, the threats are coming from elsewhere. Uh, a different example is with the aquatic warbler. And you can see its historical range, which was broadly across Europe, it's now uh, pretty much uh, extinct or, or not viable in Western Europe. It's only in those areas you see the dark uh, dots where it, it can be found in, in you know, viable numbers. Uh, and there the issue is in fact destruction of the peatland ecosystems where it lives, where it depends for breeding. I have just one more uh, slide that I wanted to put up because uh, this is a, obviously a topic of the day. And uh, Actually, before I get to this, uh, basically CMS, um, there's a lot of uh, information to share, but the species I just showed you, what we do is work with those countries and with partners such as UNEP uh, through the, the Peatlands Partnership uh, to try to address both the species, the threats to species, as well as to their habitats. So for the species I showed you, we have either uh, an agreement uh, in the form of a binding agreement or an MOU with specific conservation actions that need to be taken. Uh, and there are some successes, which is the positive news. Now back to, to this slide, uh, migratory species and zoonoses. As you might know, uh, the future infectious diseases that, that uh, address, that affect human beings, um, more and more are coming actually from animals, from wild animals or domestic species that have been uh, in close proximity to wild species. And there's a risk, increasing risk of a spillover of pathogens, as many as 75% of future infectious diseases are predicted to come from animals. What's interesting is that the causes, the top risks of a spillover have been identified as two things. One, is consumptive use of wild species. And we see pictures of the markets and trade. It's not just, uh, you know, it's not all trade, it's not all uses, but there's linkage that the more exposure and use of wild species, uh, there's higher risk uh, from some activities. The second is habitat loss and fragmentation. So that the closer the human activities and humans get to species, uh, the more likelihood that there'll be a spillover. What's interesting is the third bullet which is that the same activities from humans also cause the greatest risk to migratory species. So maintaining healthy, well-connected ecosystems is important not only for migratory species, but it's also important for human health. It's a really uh, strong indicator of our connectedness 
and bringing it back to peatlands, why we need to pay attention to peatlands, to their uh, restoration, to their conservation uh, for migratory species and their habitats. So my last slide to remember, stay connected. And here's how you can uh, find out more uh, by reaching out to us through our website. We're on Facebook and we're on Twitter. So thanks again for the invitation and uh, I look forward to the other presentations. Thank you so much, Executive Secretary. It's phenomenal to hear some positive examples, some good news from CMS, um, as well as a reminder about the importance of the connectivity uh, for so many species at different times in their life cycle. Um, we will segue from your conversation uh, about the reminders about the importance of these habitats in terms of thinking about health uh, to our next speaker, uh, Vice Minister for Environment and Forest of the Government of Indonesia. Uh, we'll be talking about building back better in a post-COVID world. Uh, Vice Minister Lu Hong, it's, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good uh, evening, of, uh, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you for giving me uh, opportunity to share uh, my presentation here. So secondly, allow me to, to, to use my uh, PowerPoint presentation. Uh, the title of my presentation is Speed Lens for Building Back Better in the Force COVID uh, World. So as uh, all of you know, uh, Indonesia is one of the uh, country with the uh, largest uh, peatland uh, in, in the world. In terms of globally, uh, we are in the in the fourth lead, uh, fourth uh, position uh, of the largest uh, peatland uh, up to Canada, Russia, and US. And in terms of tropical, our special extent of our peatland is uh, in the first uh, place where we have around uh, 15 million hectares of, of peatland uh, in Indonesia. And all of us already recognize the, 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 the imp important roles of, uh, of, of tropical peatland in particular. First of all, uh, to, to protecting biodiversity and protecting environments and controlling uh, climate change, uh, supporting uh, in particular uh, community livelihood. And in terms of biodiversity, for example, uh, Indonesian peatland, uh, you know, uh, con uh, <clears throat> constituted uh, as a home for endemics and various endemics and specific uh, biodiversity, uh, both fauna and flora, like tiger, orang utan, uh, any kind of, uh, you know, endemic species, gibbons, and also uh, specific uh, uh, peatland uh, plants and so on. Uh, there's very various or uh, numbers of uh, biodiversity in our peatland, and also uh, peatland in Indonesia support you know uh, livelihood for the local community, uh, and also you know uh, source for food, non-timber forest product, water supply, and flood control, fire risk control any kind of uh, education, social, economics uh, uh, services that provided by peatland, including uh, sometime uh, culture and religious uh, activities. And yeah, all of us know that the peatland is a, uh, like a specific uh, ecosystem that's very important uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, mitigating or mitigating in particular climate change because peatland store substantial uh, or, or, or carbon organic matters that are uh, very important to control climate change. Uh, about 30 up to 40% of global soil carbon actually storing into, in, into the peatland areas. And one particular characteristic of peatland is uh, because it's water. I mean, hydrological, 90% of, of peatland actually water, uh, apart from this uh, very important organic matters. But this uh, specific and unique ecosystem actually quite vulnerable get, uh, against uh, uh, human or anthropogenic uh, activities. Uh, 
For example, like conversion to other activities, drainage of peatlands, fires, and so on. Some of these kind of activities actually not really benign on, on peatland ecosystem. So we need to, to address or to control this in, in, in sustainable or wise way in order to avoid the peatland from being uh, degraded. In Indonesia, in order to avoid this further degradation, I mean, government of Indonesia, in particular the uh, Ministry of Environment and Forestry, where they put in place a number of regulations in order to control it, for example, how to protect peatland with a number of regulations, how to protect, uh, to maintain the water level in the peatland and so on, and how to, 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 to conserve peatland. For example, in our in our regulation, we allocated that peatland deeper than three meters, for example, has has to be protected. And part of the pit uh, pit uh, well, we got that uh, peatland uh, hydrological unit in the new regulation about thirty percent of it uh, has to be uh, conserved for, for 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 conservation or protection of hydrological and so on. And also in terms of peatland management, we uh, have a certain criteria and indicator in terms of water table, uh, you know, uh, a level. For example, in the cultivation, we not allow to have uh, water table uh, uh, lower than 40 centimeters uh, from the feed surface, for example. And there are many others regulation that were part of the correction of corrective action that we try to improve our peatland management in the future. And just a couple of example, for example, measures, a corrective measures that we have been implemented in Indonesia. For example, we already <clears throat> put in place like a moratorium of new concession peatland. And we also have a policy if certain or any uh, pitland uh, concession uh, fire happen in that concession, for example, we have to refoc it and and uh, to, to uh, after that we have to do a restoration on, on it. And substantial uh, government uh, effort now also to do a restoration of the graded peatland while in the meantime we, we conserve the pristine and healthy peatland in order to support uh, uh, livelihood so very important in indonesia uh, we, we we not just uh, uh, protect or conserve peatland for, for for protection of a biodiversity and others but also very important to to support uh, communities uh, livelihood that living in and surrounding a uh, peatland ecosystem and fire management also one of the very important strategic me measures that already implemented in indonesia uh, like uh, to in in terms of uh, prevention fire suppression improving uh, human resources capacity and equipment as well as uh, we, we strengthen uh, partnership with uh, fire uh, uh, with local communities and and establish like a community based fire prevention uh, measure and currently we are developing uh, you know we, we call it a permanent uh, permanent solution to this uh, pitland fires in indonesia uh, through a separate uh, serial uh, economics uh, or livelihood intervention uh, for, for communities in the, in the peatland areas. How uh, Indonesian government to, to, to building uh, back better uh, in, in relation with this uh, uh, COVID-19, uh, yeah? Uh, the Indonesian government really committed to work together uh, in with, with multi stakeholders in effort to recover health, economic, and social problem that caused by this uh, COVID 19 pandemic. And at the moment, we have a two big uh, program. Uh, we call it extraordinary uh, program uh, nationally. First is we call it a uh, national health recovery uh, uh, program, and the second one is a national economic recovery uh, program. So we, we do it, uh, 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 these two big extraordinary uh, uh, program in order to uh, address, you know, the impact 
of this COVID-19 pandemic to the health and also economic, but also in terms of environments. So uh, our commitment for building back better, for example, we continuously our effort to implement sustainable peatland management by promoting uh, sustainable uh, peatland ecosystem management in order to keep uh, this uh, pristine and healthy uh, uh, peatland ecosystem and including in this case to do this kind of uh, uh, restoration of degraded peatland. And second uh, uh, commitment is to, uh, about law enforcement and governance. Uh, currently, we, we <clears throat> uh, tightly if, uh, effort uh, to, to, to improve our forest law enforcement and governance, in, including to, to, to put uh, effective measure to stop uh, this kind of illegal logging and wildlife trade. And the third uh, uh, commitment is to, to improve our investment in the, in the forest related works. Uh, in order to uh, preventing deforestation and forest degradation and also increase forest area to investment related work, uh, uh, part of the stim stimulus, we call it for packets, stimulus packet for economic recovery. For example, we put a substantial investment currently to, to, to help communities with, we call it social forestry uh, uh, groups uh, of uh, social forestry uh, Farmer groups in order to improve their uh, economic activities, and the the last uh, commitment is uh, uh, we call it post COVID nineteen recovery program. We undertake uh, you know post COVID recovery program to improve li livelihood uh, as well as build a resilient to forest dependent uh, communities. So a uh, new stra strategies uh, have been implemented in response to COVID nineteen. Uh, pandemic to support forest farmer, for example. We, one is uh, through the bank persona. Bank persona is like an abbreviation of Pengembangan Perhutanan Social Nasional atau, or National uh, Social Forestry Development. So through this program, we, we provide incentive uh, to the social uh, forestry group. In, if they implement, we call it learning outcome in the business plan by selecting cluster for forest and food commodities that can be used to provide the, uh, production inputs such as seed, fertilizers, and pesticide. And what, uh, second is a national economic recovery. At the moment, government of Indonesia through Ministry of Environment and Forestry, we provide uh, like around 200 million uh, rupiah or around a third, more than 13,000 uh, US dollar to each uh, social forestry business group with aim to achieve you know, food security to developing agro agroforestry and providing uh, productive economic uh, tools. And third uh, strategy is local wisdom. We provide education to social uh, forestry farmer with focus on strengthening uh, local wisdom with innovation and, and technology in, in, in food production and intens uh, intensification. So thanks good with this kind of COVID also because we actually change, uh, uh, you know, like shifting from previous face-to-face uh, -face, uh, learning system into the virtual learning system at the moment. Uh, it's quite uh, effective here. Yeah. And this part of the fourth strategy. So we use mostly right now uh, communication, education, training with the uh, e-learning system. We call it e-learning system, where uh, we encourage farmers to think not ecological uh, centrically, but also ecocentrically by simultaneously, you know, conveying both productive ways and ecological views, so farmer can adapt uh, uh, the current condition. And this is one uh, last, my last slide. Actually, uh, community empowerment uh, program in conservation area. So apart from the, the production and utilization uh, areas, we also introduce uh, some, uh, uh, we call it a community uh, empowerment program within conservation area. For example, we develop, uh, you know, conservation village where community group uh, that, uh, receive already capacity in order to manage conservation area 
and we 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 provide them as a, as a partners you know in order to 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 develop uh, uh, conservation activities and second uh, uh, program is to give uh, access to them for, to to uh, utilize you know non timber forest product collection for example for traditional cultivation traditional hunting or utilization of water resources and and also uh, ecotourism activities and the last one is partnership part uh, facilitation we also provide them with a uh, uh, we call it financial capital marketing infrastructure governance as well as uh, uh, the use of uh, technology so i think that my uh, presentation and uh, many thanks for your kind attention i back to you shara Thank you very much, Vice Minister. Uh, fantastic to take us from the global perspective to a uh, chance to really focus on some of the wonderful things that Indonesia is doing in Asia and um, begin to think about um, human health and the COVID building back better. Um, to continue this conversation, uh, we'll go to Hans Schulten, who is the peatlands lead for Wetlands International. He's going to speak to us about restoring Russian peatlands uh, both the challenges and the opportunities. Hans, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, um, um, community around me. And thank you also the established speakers in just in front of me. Um, I've learned a lot and I'm humbled to be in, in, in this, this excellent um, set of speakers. What I'd like to do is to bring you down to and um, take that journey as um, to, to, to Russia to Russia in 2010, the summer of 2010. In front of you, see, you see the red square covered in, in gray smog, acrid smoke, clouds of smoke envelop everything. What happened there is that as a resultant of that, and I'm trying, yeah, 50,000 excess deaths were recorded in the Moscow region in 2020. But why was this happening? What was going on? It was, this was caused by degraded peatlands around the Moscow area in Russia that, that, uh, that caught fire. The smoke of that drifted towards Moscow, created respiratory illnesses, enhanced and in exacerbated respiratory illnesses, and caused the problems that I just spoke about and the resulting in excess deaths. So there is a direct link here between the health and the quality of the peatlands and the health and the quality of, of, of people. And yes, we are sitting at this moment in time in the middle of a pandemic that is environment is globally, but we also need to make sure that we look at the, the other pandemics or the other um, situations that are happening around the globe as well. So taking you from Moscow and the peatlands, let's go on, and now on a much more positive note because I am positive and Wetlands International is there to, to drive change in this world. So out of these <coughs> the situations, we uh, worked together with the, um, the, the federal ministry in, uh, in Germany and through um, a whole series of partners and started um, developing a project called Restoring Peatlands in Russia for Fire Prevention and Climate Change Mitigation. And that's been happening from 2011. And what I will show is that it will go on. We've just been given the, the go ahead and just started implementing phase three of that. We don't do this alone. We do this with a whole series of partners, including the financiers sitting behind there, but also delivery partners on the ground, including those in Russia and including in Germany. So we are the, the, the center in this, uh, the spill to make sure this is all happening. So why, why Russia and why are we focusing there? Um, as you can see on the slide that you see, just see in front of you, peatlands are widely distributed around Russia and the Russia Federation. Not only the shallow peats, but also the deeper peats. It's massively extensive and it's the, the highest area, one of the highest areas. So if we then look into detail and what's actually going on, then the degraded peatlands that um, were getting dry and caught the fire and caused these human health issues are very focused and centered in the West in the west of the Russian Federation and in some particular counties or some particular provinces. As a fact, um, the Russian Federation is the second largest global emitter of greenhouse gas emissions from degraded peatlands, according to, to the global um, peatland database run by Greifswald Meyer Center. And later on, 
you'll hear back from Gryphos Midas Center in one of the presenters later on after me. So 10 million hectares of peatlands have been drained and used for agriculture out of those four and a half million uh, for forestry, um, peat extraction and for um, agriculture. So these, these peatlands were degraded and, we, and caught fire. So the project was around how can we restore them? What can we do to change that and not, at, at, not only improve the ecology, the ecological restoration, but also reduce the greenhouse gas emissions associated with these degraded peatlands, with these dry peatlands, and also re at the same time reduce the, um, the human health aspects, the fire risk reduction. So we first started off with two phases, phase one and phase two, whereby the project developed solutions, not only on the green, the ecological restoration, the yellow on the climate smart rewetting and the red on the fire risk reduction. They're talking about these are hectares running up to um, nine and 900, uh, yeah, 94,000 hectares in the total of the fire risk reduction, 64,000 hectares for um, climate smart rewetting and 21,000 hectares for ecological restoration. But we've just been given um, the go ahead and been awarded a phase three in there, whereby we'll be extending this in up until 2024 uh, and restoring another 140,000 hectares for fire risk reduction. And you can see the numbers here for the climate smart rewetting and ecological restoration. So out of a um, out of a bad thing, out of fires and out of direct action and out of support, we created a restoration not only from ecology, but also reduced and um, climate, uh, climate um, emissions and greenhouse gas emissions and a reduced fire risk. So how did we do that? There's, there's a series of ways and as I showed, I will show you. First of all, the rewetting and you will see here that the rewetting was predominantly done by blocking drainage ditches so that the water table gets higher and then the peatland will recover over time. What we also uh, measured in there and is the greenhouse gas emissions because it's not only uh, reducing the direct impact on human health but also the indirect Im impact on human health through the our changing climate. So as a resultant of the of the first two phases, we are reducing the, um, the amount of emissions that are reduced by about 168,000 to 242,000 tons of carbon um, dioxide equivalent per annum. We've measured that and we're, we're in the process and we're in, in, the, in the last phase, we're also working together with the, Russian, um, um, with the Russian ministry to include this and make this part of their NDC contributions. So it is peatland rewetting, it's monitoring and um, greenhouse gas emissions. So how did we do that? And I think that's very important because science is not the only way on how you do this. Science is important and understanding how peatlands work is important, but as a recipe for, for success, it's really important that we get local buy-in in the delivery and we build capacity on the ground. A project can deliver for two, three, four, maybe 10 years if we're lucky, but the only way on how we get long-term change and long-term success if we get buy-in from the local community and build capacity on the ground. So we create a long lasting success. What is also very important that we found out and especially in this is high level buy-in and, and to celebrate the success. These, these, um, the initial agreement on this was signed by high level buy-in. As you can see, the, uh, the minister signing it on the top left graph but also celebrating success and showcasing that these are really positive changes and that we can learn from each other and just share the experience. For example, the, um, the project um, got the UN Momentum for Change Climate Solution Award in 2017 at the COP23 conference. So at, just to wrap this up, a, a bad thing happened. Yeah, we saw peatlands degrading and we knew these peatlands were degrading. At the same time, we knew that um, there was a solution in, in, and um, there was a solution there possible. So out of this bad thing, we created and turned that around in a good situation whereby now the peatlands are being stored, the biodiversity is being stored, carbon is being kept in the ground and being actively sequestered 
and we see that the, um, the, the human health aspects are much improved. The only way on how we can do that is bringing technical expertise together with stakeholder engagement and government commitment so we can really change landscapes for the better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Hans. How fantastic to end with a positive story. I know there's so much need for those clear-cut examples of where an investment had a true impact and we can really show how this can work in other places. Um, so moving from, uh, from these speakers to a European perspective, um, our next speaker is Tina Coffey, who is an award-winning nature photographer and the author of Tapestry of Light, Ireland's Bogs and Wetlands as Never Seen Before. Uh, she'll be speaking on peatlands uh, through the lens of diversity and history in a miniature. Uh, Tina, the floor is yours. Oh, thank you so much, Susan. Uh, it's wonderful to be here and I'm in great company. Um, I am in Ireland, so hello from Ireland, wherever you are. Um, my name is Tina Claffey and I'm an Irish nature photographer. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, having worked for years in the industrial and fashion photography industry, um, in 2000, I was immersed into the world of nature photography in Botswana in Southern Africa. And for nine years, I lived there and I was photographing the flora and fauna and wildlife while working as a documentary photographer on flamingo migrations and in the safari industry. And this is a crocodile eye from one of the biggest wetlands in the world, that's uh, the Okavango Delta. So when I returned to Ireland in 2009, I felt very lost. I missed the wilderness and I missed the wild places. And in 2011, I went for a walk in my local bog uh, with botanist and geologist John Feehan. And he gave each of us a magnifying glass and he revealed to us the flora and fauna that we would easily pass by unseen. So this experience really opened my eyes to this incredible and ancient wilderness right on my doorstep. So I've been exploring these wondrous bogs through the seasons with my macro lens, which allows me to capture this ancient wilderness in its minuteness, seeing beyond what the human eye is capable of. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you, go, go through the bog, through the eye of my macro lens, and just to give you a taster of what is hidden out there. So this is what I call nature's eye. This is frog spawn, and it's the first sign of life in the spring. So the sun was shining and it lit a reed below the surface of the frog spawn, illuminating one cell. And as I looked through the macro lens, it appeared like an eye was staring straight back at me. So like the eye of mother nature herself. And this is sphagnum moss. Now sphagnum moss, as you all are aware of, is the most extensive plant on the bog. In fact, they created our bogs. They're an amazing species that can hold 20 times their own weight in water. There are many species of them and they come in all shapes and sizes and color. So I call this one sphagnum bouquet. And this is the marsh marigold. And the marsh marigold is the first flower to appear in the spring. And it lets us know that the bog is waking up. So this flower supplies, supplies much needed nectar for emerging insects. And this is an emerging spore from its mossy bed. But the macro lens really is a, one, a wonderful tool that allows me to capture miniature otherworldly scenes like this that coexist with us. And these are hairy shield bugs. They're mating hairy shield bugs and they are on the iconic bog cotton plant. You can tell why they might, might be called shield bugs with their wonderful armored backs. And this is the dark tussock moth caterpillar feasting on bog cotton. I was fascinated by his little feet as he moved up the stalk of the plant. So as I do for most of my photography, I am on the ground, I'm lying face down taking these photographs and getting very wet in the process. But um, this is my perspective of this little guy. And this is bog asphodel. So the arrival of bog asphodel indicates that summer has arrived. It's a very beautiful flower um, and it completely transforms to a deep orange when it's in its fruiting form in the autumn. And this 
is the most, for me, the most iconic plant um, on the bog. It's the round leaved sundew and it has adapted to survive in the sterile conditions on the bog. It's a deadly carnivore, very innocent looking, but it's a deadly carnivore. Insects are attracted to its sweet, sticky tentacles. And once they land on it, they're doomed. The tentacles close over the insect and it is digested. And the sundew receives the nitrogen it needs. And this, for all arachnophobes, you can turn away now, but this is the raft spider. And it, here in Ireland, this is our largest spider, our truly most impressive, impressive spider as well. He's a wonderful hunter. Um, they don't spin webs to capture their prey. Um, they're semi-aquatic, hunting on the water and under the water and on the solid ground as well. They are truly amazing to, to photograph. And this really is a success story. This is the, um, peatlands really are a haven for our biodiversity. This is the marsh fritillary, and it's a wonderful butterfly that has made a remarkable recovery after an absence of almost 20 years. And that really is thanks to the conservation efforts here in Ireland, especially by the likes of the Living Bog Project. And this otherworldly scene are pixie cup lichen. Um, to me, they looked so mystical in the morning sun. I imagined that possibly they were enchanted goblets belonging to otherworldly kings and queens. And this is the devil's matchsticks. It's an, an, another beautiful lichen with its scarlet tips. To me, this looked like a miniature tree in a frosty peatland landscape. And the bogs and the peatlands, you really don't expect to find such wonders as these. These are, um, this is a marsh hellebrine orchid. Um, the, the peatlands host many species of orchid, this being my favourite. Um, a spectacular orchid that can be found in the summertime. And in the autumn, the heather comes into bloom and a bog is really transformed into a sea of purple. And it's, it's, it's really a, a wonderful time of the year to come to the bog. What also comes into bloom is the devil's bit scabious, this beautiful purple flower. And it's wonderful for insects in this late season. This birch shield bug is making the most of this wonderful flower and it's heavily covered in morning dew and appears to be almost encrusted with ruby jewels as it fed on the flower. And this is bracken fern, which turns from green to deep orange and gold in the autumn and it recedes in a blaze of glory as the evening sun illuminates it. And this is frozen sphagnum moss. Um, as I explored the bog one day in midwinter, a tiny sphagnum moss caught my eye as the sun lit up the ice in a shallow bog pool. And I must say, when I looked through the macro lens, I really couldn't believe my eyes. The frozen sphagnum was perfectly preserved in the ice as if suspended in animation surrounded by a galaxy of tiny frozen bubbles. And this is my book, Tapestry of Light, that was released in 2017. Unfortunately, it's sold out now, but I am working my way towards a second book. Um, the purpose of my photography is to raise awareness, to reveal what treasures we have and to inspire the viewer to conserve it. And in our quest for conservation and awareness, really, photography is a wonderful asset. It's a powerful tool as it's a universal language. And I really hope you've enjoyed my presentation. These are all my contact details and all of my um, social media outlets. So thank you again. The honor is totally mine to be here among such wonderful uh, speakers. And I wish everyone well and looking forward to the rest of the presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Tina. Just extraordinary images, and you brought us all closer, uh, closer to the the extraordinary uh, diversity and these uh, these beautiful species that are there um, that so many of us could never really have a chance to glimpse in that way. I would love to to imagine you there um, on your belly in the in the wet uh, forest taking <laughs> these photos. Just amazing. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker will talk about the plight of the aquatic warbler and the importance of peatlands in wildlife health. Um, this is Francisca Tenenberg, who's the director of the Gries Meyer Center. Francisca.
Francisca, you have the floor. Thank you very much. I will take you now along our journey to a very small bird. It has been mentioned before in Amy's talk. And this bird is actually connecting now the two continents, uh, Europe and Africa. So we'll, we'll move along uh, our journey towards Africa. And I'm representing the Greifswald Meyer Center and also the BirdLife International Aquatic Warbler Conservation Team. You can also put it differently. This is a story about peatlands, about people, and about a little brown bird connecting these people. And all these people you can see on the slide uh, uh, in uh, 2007 in Senegal, they are, for example, connected by this bird. So what is about this bird? What is so special about it? Um, this uh, little brown bird is very small. It weighs only 12 gram. It's a passerine bird. It sings very nicely, um, but very little people can actually hear it. It breeds in fen peatlands in Europe and it winters in West Africa. So it is a long distance migrant uh, and it connects uh, the two continents. The aquatic warbler also has an unusual breeding system with promiscuity. The broods are fathered by several fathers usually, and they have uniparental care by the female. Um, and there are a lot of special adaptations also to the special habitat they live in. The aquatic warbler was once widespread and numerous. In Europe, it was once here in Germany called the sparrow of the Myers, widespread as a very common sparrow. Today, the species is globally threatened and the entire world population is estimated to be around 11,000 singing males, the counting unit of this bird, because you can only detect the singing males and uh, a similar amount of females, um, hopefully. This map now shows you the breeding size sites here in Europe. You see countries like Poland, uh, Belarus, and Ukraine. Uh, these countries um, harbor still a lot of peatlands. Um, and the yellow, um, tiny little parts of this map, they are actually the breeding habitats of this bird. Um, there were also habitats in Lithuania, in Germany, and in Hungary, but it is a very, very restricted breeding range nowadays. So the sites are very limited and scattered. This map now shows you uh, a bit closer look to two key countries, Germany and Poland. The dark parts of this map are the peatlands of our countries. So we have a lot of peatlands, for example, in North Germany and also more in North Poland. You see a bit of the Baltic Sea. And then the green parts of this map are the breeding sites of the aquatic warbler after the year 2000. So the recent breeding sites we still have. The other colored spots indicate breeding records from the past. And you can see, so we have quite a good historical knowledge of the distribution of this species. You can see that there were uh, aquatic warblers uh, present in, in, in the Netherlands, for example, in all around Northern Germany. And now they have retreated to the east. Why are they retreating to the east? There's another historical map I would like to uh, share with you. Uh, this is uh, from the European Myers book, um, a large group of European peatland scientists prepared in 2017. Here you can see uh, peatland areas in Europe and uh, a year or a period indicated next to it. And um, this is connected to the direction how the knowledge of peatland drainage was actually spread in Europe. It started largely in, in the Netherlands, in countries where they um, had found out how to build polders, how to drain peatlands. And then this knowledge uh, spread along the, the um, 12th, 13th century, for example, to Poland, where such land areas were drained in the 16th, 17th century, and further east to Ukraine uh, up to the 19th century. So there is a connection between the distribution of peatland drainage knowledge and the um, decrease of this bird species. The aquatic warbler is uh, not only a species for itself, it is also a flagship for the breeding sites for fen peatlands. Here in the breeding sites, you can see other bird species like the corn crake, the great uh, common snipe, um, the uh, butterfly, the larger copper, but also a very beautiful plant species um, like bog myrtle and bog bean. And this is similar in the wintering sites in West Africa. Also here, birds like the winding cystico, the bayon's craig, um, the gray-headed kingfisher or blue throats, they can be found in these habitats. 
So what do we need to do to protect this um, peatland bird? A key issue is networking, knowledge sharing, exchange between all the countries where the bird uh, is um, flying along and breeding and wintering. And there's a very active uh, aquatic warbler conservation team under BirdLife International. And um, the European Union and other funders have uh, funded large uh, projects where also this networking was part of. Then there's also a convention uh, of the, on the conservation of migratory species or wild animals, the CMS Memorandum of Understanding. This is uh, the only such memorandum of understanding for such a little brown bird. It was concluded in Minsk in Belarus, one of the key breeding range countries in um, 2003. And this MOU helps uh, substantially to bring the people together who are dealing with this bird, are um, caring for its protection along the flyway. It is also very important to improve knowledge. As you can imagine, it is a small bird. It's, uh, uh, it's hiding in the wetland vegetation. It's not so easy to spot and um, it's migrating over long distances. Um, there are still knowledge gaps about migration and wintering and um, satellite tracking is not possible for such a small bird. You can do it with white storks and increasingly smaller birds, but for such a small bird with 12 grams, it's still not feasible. But there are geolocators that actually record the light um, and then um, you can also reconstruct the flyway. And this is um, such kind of research is being done since 2012. And a key issue is habitat restoration. We need to restore the aquatic warbler's habitat. We need to shift from, on the left-hand side, the drain peatlands to wet green peatlands, healthy peatlands. And a rewetted peatland would then look like this, for example. We also need to maintain the habitats of the aquatic warbler. In nutrient-rich environments now, mowing is needed to actually keep a vegetation structure uh, suitable for it. And you need mowing machinery for this. You need um, support to farmers. And if you have restored a habitat, it can be necessary to actually reintroduce the species by translocation of aquatic warblers from one breeding site to a potential breeding site that has been restored. And this is being done by an EU life project led by Baltic Environment Forum um, since 2017. And you can see on the pictures the, uh, how the birds were actually brought to cages and then uh, fed with local food, how community involvement worked. And um, there's a lot of uh, very good information on this on their website. And what I can also tell you, um, and it was really open also to us as scientists, these translocated birds they flew to Africa and they have returned to the restored habitats in Lithuania. This is really a success story. Species do not go extinct alone. They represent an ecosystem. And in case of the aquatic warbler, a peatland ecosystem, a threatened ecosystem. And we should protect it for us and for future generations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, we now, you provided a bridge to Africa for us. So now we can um, hear more about peatlands as reservoirs for wildlife populations and human health in Africa. Um, and uh, it's a pleasure to introduce a lecturer from Marianne Ngawi University in Grazaville, a uh, lecturer suspense, eco suspense, will be speaking on peatlands as a refuge for rare and endangered species. Professor Suspense, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much. Just time to share the screen. Just to tell me if uh, you have my screen to please. Bonjour, je veux savoir est-ce que mon écran est visible? Oui, nous pouvons voir votre écran. Merci. Peut-être le mettre en mode présentation. OK, c'est bon? Oui, c'est bon. Euh, je dois bouger l'écran pour la vidéo. OK. Voilà. Merci beaucoup pour euh, cette opportunité que vous nous donnez de faire cette présentation qui a pour euh, titre les tourbières comme refuge de biodiversité 
pour les espèces rares et menacées. Je voudrais aussi dire merci à l'UNEP pour l'invitation qui a été adressée à, à moi et puis à l'équipe Congopit pour préparer cette présentation. Alors tout de suite, je voudrais dire que la, la troubière qui aujourd'hui est rendue célèbre a été mise en valeur par euh, un article, sinon un article qui a été publié en 2017 dans la revue Nature et la ministre Arlette Soudan-Nono a largement euh, fait part des résultats de cette publication de 2017. Et ici, je voudrais juste dire que cette publication part de longues années de recherche des données qui avaient été collectées sur le terrain dans la zone Nord-Congo, notamment par une collaboration entre l'équipe conduite par le professeur Simon Lewis, mais aussi des chercheurs de l'Université marie Wabi. Alors, cette, euh, ces nombreuses années de recherche ont abouti à la publication, on va dire, de cette carte que vous voyez bien, qui aujourd'hui est devenue célèbre. Cette carte qui présente l'étendue de la tourbière qui s'étend sur 145 000 km. Et tout au long des recherches, nous nous sommes aperçus que cette zone humide était riche en biodiversité, tant sur le plan floristique que sur le plan euh, phonique. Il faut aussi dire que lorsqu'on a fait la datation de la tourbière, sinon de la tourbe, les résultats ont donné que cette tourbe était très vieille et âgée d'environ 11 000 années, ce qui montre à suffisance que nous avons ici affaire à un écosystème mature, très stable, et donc il y a des fortes chances que les différentes espèces que nous allons vous présenter ici sont pour la plupart des espèces inféodées, des espèces locales. Alors, pour ce qui est de la biodiversité floristique, les différents inventaires qui ont été réalisés par les différentes équipes de Congo Tourbière nous ont révélé qu'il y avait des espèces caractéristiques de la zone de Tourbière. Et ici, nous vous présentons ici euh, des espèces comme Wapaka, Paludosa, Carapa, Procera, qui sont des espèces indicatrices. Mais il faut aussi reconnaître, sinon avouer, qu'il y a encore plusieurs espèces encore indéterminé et les prochains travaux permettront de pouvoir apporter des réponses. En dehors donc des tourbières forestières, nous avons aussi des tourbières qui se sont développées dans des forêts marécageuses qui sont très riches en raffia laurentii et d'autres tourbes qui ont été découvertes dans des forêts marécageuses développées euh, par des espèces raffia okeri. En dehors des espèces ligneuses, nous avons aussi des espèces non ligneuses, comme ici, nous vous présentons dans cette photographie des photos qui ont été prises dans la zone de tourbière et qui représentent ici des champignons. Et nous en sommes convaincus, pour la raison écologique que j'ai avancée précédemment, que parmi ces champignons, nous avons des espèces encore non déterminées, non découvertes. Pour ce qui est de la biodiversité phonique, nous, nous nous sommes appuyés sur les travaux de recherche qui ont été menés par un de nos collègues ici à l'Université marin Wabi, notamment le professeur Victor Mamonekene, qui a fait quelques travaux de recherche dans la zone nord de la Likwala et notamment dans la zone de la Tourbière. Et il s'est avéré qu'il y avait des espèces de poissons qui étaient euh, caractéristiques de cet écosystème-là. Et à l'image ici, en image plutôt, vous avez quelques photos qu'il m'a communiquer pour montrer les espèces qui étaient euh, présentes dans cette zone euh, de la tourbière. En dehors de cela, nous vous présentons aussi quelques photos euh, des araignées qui ont été prises, des photos prises dans la zone de tourbière. Il faut dire ici qu'il y a, on a besoin des spécialistes, euh, on va dire, dans ce domaine-là pour venir et nous aider à déterminer si ce sont des espèces nouvelles ou des espèces déjà découvertes. Mais sinon, qu'en allant sur le terrain, il y a beaucoup d'araignées, beaucoup de papillons, comme, vous, comme nous sommes en train de vous montrer là. Il y a aussi, euh, au niveau de la mégafaune, 14 espèces menacées au niveau mondial, mais aussi 10 espèces prioritaires au niveau national. Et parmi ces espèces animales qui appartiennent donc à cette catégorie de la mégafaune, nous avons des éléphants de forêt, nous avons aussi des bonobos, nous avons des chimpanzés, nous avons des céphalophes. Ici, vous avez des céphalophes à dos jaune, mais aussi des céphalophes à bande transversale 
qui sont rencontrés régulièrement dans cette zone de terre humide, mais beaucoup plus associés à la zone de la tourbière. Nous avons aussi rencontré dans cette zone de la tourbière des crocodiles, et ici il y a le crocodile nain présenté par cette photo, le crocodile nain, mais aussi nous avons des panthères. La meilleure de l'histoire, c'est quoi C'est que euh, toutes ces espèces ne causent pas la peur des différentes espèces, de, plutôt des différents chercheurs qui vont sur le terrain. En dehors de ces espèces que je viens de vous présenter, Thank you so much, Ifo. Uh, we hope that uh, that we captured uh, the majority of your presentation. We lost you there at the end, uh, but a phenomenal overview from the microscopic to the megafauna. Uh, from Africa, we'd like to go to South America. And uh, one thing that we have to share is um, a video from Christine McDevitt, who is, uh, McDevitt Thompson, who is the president of the Tompkins Conservation and the UN patron of protection, protected areas. Uh, and so we'll turn it over to the vi video um, as we transition to talking about South America peatlands collaborating and innovating for conservation of planetary health. Hey everybody, I'm Chris Tompkins, president of Tompkins Conservation and the UN patron for protected areas. Back in the early 90s, my husband Doug and I decided we wanted to commit ourselves to joining in and restoring a healthy planet with big, wild and connected landscapes where all life can flourish. With our teams and the partnership of the governments of Chile and Argentina, we protected over 14.5 million acres through the creation of 15 new national parks. And about 15 years ago, we realized that we have to stop and ask who's missing. And we began to work in what we call rewilding, bringing back species that had gone extinct wherever we were working. We hope to fully restore ecosystems uh, before we call our work done. All my life I've been drawn to really harsh environments and those with diverse forms of life and vast and wild landscapes. Argentina's Peninsula Mitre is exactly one of those places with 3,000 square kilometers of land and 2,000 square kilometers of coastal ocean. And it's at the very tip of South America. It's one of those magical places. Here there are broad mountains, broad valleys, beach forests, lakes, rivers, and linked throughout by peatlands. These extraordinary ecosystems are proving to be crucial for the health of the planet. In seeking to protect Peninsula Mitre, we have joined local grassroots organizations in a 17-year campaign to safeguard the tip of the Americas. Historically, this was the land of the Hausch, a culture of hunter-gatherers driven extinct by European colonization. Not an uncommon story. But there are hundreds of archaeological sites dot the landscape still in Peninsula Mitre. The peninsula also has a unique marine ecosystem. Here, where the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans meet up with the Antarctic currents, 
They create a rich feeding ground for abundant marine mammals such as sea lions, orcas, humpback whales, as well as seabirds and the occasional Andean condor. You can also find endangered species such as the striated caracara and the southern river otter. They're all there, but in low and fragile numbers. So here's the key point about Peninsula Mitre. It has a vast peatlands that are largely intact. Peatlands represent 45% of the peninsula area, the largest extension of undisturbed peat in South America. Peat makes up the planet's largest terrestrial carbon, but not all varieties offer the same degree of carbon capture. What's special about Mitre are the cushion-type bogs of Astelia pumila. Remember that name. The dominant species of Peninsula Mitre, this variety absorbs over four times the amount of carbon as any other type of peat. In total, these peatlands store 315 million metric tons of carbon, which is the equivalent to three years of emissions in Argentina. When you think about it, their contribution is so massive that they merit immediate and permanent protection. Obtaining protected status is key to ensuring that this remote place will help mitigate climate change long into the future. Argentina's most important carbon capture point, Peninsula Mitre, is home to nearly 84% of the country's peatlands. As ecosystems, they are both fragile and they're irreplaceable. These peatlands started forming 18,000 years ago and grow only half a millimeter per year. That's what's at stake. You take them out, it's not likely they'll come back. Global peatlands currently capture a third of the world's carbon found in soil and double that quantity stored in plant biomass. That's how efficient they are. They also help the environment adapt to climate change by regulating water flow, they retain water during floods and providing it in periods of drought. It's like a perfect system. A recent New York Times article pointed to a study published in Environmental Research Letters that determined that peat bogs could help us achieve our world climate goals. At this very moment, the legislature of Argentina is debating a law that would define, inventory, and protect wetlands around the country. Argentina will be leading in this. It's time for natural climate solutions to join mainstream policy. We may start by protecting the places we know and love, but it's time that we defend the wild places and become vocal advocates for peatlands. The future of all life depends on it. Thank you very much. So powerful. Uh, really puts it in context when you think about it as uh, representing the equivalent of three years of national emissions in Argentina. Uh, really, really powerful video. Uh, staying in uh, South America, our next speaker uh, is the Vice Minister for Strategic Development of Natural Resources from the government of Peru. Uh, Vice Minister Gabriel Quijandro Acosta will be speaking on designing policy interventions for peatland conservation in the case of Peru. Vice Minister, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Susan. Um, uh, if you allow, allow me to put my, my video. Oh, okay. My video is there. 
Can you see me now? Okay. Yes, very well. I, I can see me now. So I will, I will share my, my screen. Excuse me. Um, let me share screen. This one. Please let me know when you see it. Is it there? Yes, perfectly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the for the invitation. It's my second global landscape forum in a, in a, in an event by the by GPI, and and I'm very very thankful that you consider Peru to be one of the of the good examples to to show on 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 your work. Now, if you allow me, I will shift to a Spanish uh, for, for, for my presentation. Eh, muchas gracias nuevamente por la, por la invitación y vamos a hacer una presentación sobre el, el, el tema de las turberas en el Perú, los, cómo, cómo, cómo estamos viendo el tema de, de la gestión y la conservación y la gestión de los, de los pitlands, de, la, de las turberas en, en el Perú, como eh, mecanismos para asegurar el cumplimiento de metas vinculadas a cambio climático y a diversidad biológica. Um, Como, como ustedes sabrán y lo hemos visto durante, durante el evento, las turberas están distribuidas a lo largo de todo, de todo el mundo. Tenemos turberas este, en, en climas templados o en climas incluso muy, muy fríos y, y tenemos esta, esta zona tropical, en el, si se quiere, en el centro del mundo, este, en el cual hay una concentración muy grande de turberas. En el caso peruano tenemos oh, alrededor entre cinco cinco en el año dos medidas en el año 2002 y siete y medio más o menos medidas en el año 2019. ¿Por qué cambia esto? O sea, ¿por qué cambia esta extensión de turberas este, existentes? Porque hay mucha información eh, que todavía no está, no está este, cotejada o no está oficializada. Lo vamos a ver cuando entremos a una, a un, en un detalle un poquito más adelante sobre, sobre la extensión, la posible extensión de las turberas en el Perú. Y ahí vemos, por ejemplo, que este, podríamos tener incluso mucho más que estas, que estas siete y medio, ¿no? Eh, pero... pero la, la idea aquí es que son un ecosistema sumamente importante y que, y, y, y por tanto, este, son objeto de, de una serie de compromisos internacionales vinculados a decisiones de UNEA, a decisiones de la Convención de Rosa, a decisiones de la Convención de Diversidad Biológica, que reconociendo la, la importancia de, de, de las turberas, eh, asignan una serie de responsabilidades a, a los estados parte para este, asegurar su conservación y su uso sostenible en el, en el largo plazo. Y aquí regresamos a esta discusión que decía yo sobre el tema de qué tan grande es o qué tan, qué, de, de qué tamaño es la extensión de las turberas en el Perú. Y si vemos aquí, eh, lo que podemos ver es eh, esto, esto que está marcado aquí en color verde, ¿no? estos números que están marcados en color verde son aquellos este, tipos de ecosistemas en los que sabemos a ciencia cierta que existe una, una, o sea, una capa de turberas este, debajo, debajo del agua, debajo del, del, del componente de, lo, de, de humedal, eh, pero, pero si uno ve eh, todos estos otros tipos de ecosistemas que están aquí, estos pantanos, los bosques de llanuras, estos ecosistemas que además, si uno los ve en el mapa, están distribuidos tanto en la zona tropical del, del bosque amazónico como en la zona altoandina, en la zona alta de los Andes, como en nuestra zona costera, este nuestra extensión de, 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 de turberas podría llegar a, a ser de la, la tres veces más grande, ¿no? Podría llegar a cubrir 17 millones de hectáreas en el país, este, pero para eso necesitamos pues, hacer mucha investigación para poder determinar a ciencia cierta que hay un contenido de, de, de turba, de pit, en, 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 estos, en estos tipos de ecosistemas. Pero vemos pues que hay ahí un, un, un proceso... En, en, en marcha, ¿no? Un proceso en camino de generación de información para mejorar la toma de decisiones. Como señalaba, nosotros somos un país en el cual tenemos turberas distribuidas en, en, la, en las tres grandes eh, bioregiones que tenemos en el país. Tenemos turberas en la, en la zona de costa frente, frente al Pacífico, eh, ¿no? D -d donde tenemos concentración de, 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 de turberas en, en, sobre todo en humedales costeros y en, en manglares. De hecho, en el Perú tenemos el manglar más austral que existe sobre la costa del Pacífico en todo, en todo el mundo. Este, tenemos también turberas que son las que están aquí a, 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 al lado izquierdo de la presentación. En la zona, en la zona altoandina son turberas más de tipo herbáceo, 
¿no? Con, 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 con formaciones que son muy importantes en eh, la regulación del ciclo hídrico, por ejemplo, en esta zona andina, y que tienen, juegan un, 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 tienen un juego muy, muy cercano con la dinámica de los glaciares y la escorrentía que producen esos glaciares todo, todos los años. Y tenemos también los, 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 nuestra mayor extensión, los manglares, los, los los pitlands, ¿no? O los, las turberas tropicales, que son las, las, las que ocurren en, en el ámbito de nuestro bosque amazónico y que incluyen eh, sobre todo lo que se llaman los pantanos de palmeras, que son la, los que tienen la mayor extensión, más este, también tur, turba o turberas en zonas de, 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 bosques, de bosques inundables este, estacionalmente. Y aquí podemos ver, o sea, estas zonas de turberas son zonas de concentración muy grande de diversidad biológica. Vemos, por ejemplo, el lago Junín en nuestra zona andina con una, una función o una contribución de la naturaleza muy importante en términos eh, de, de, de lugar de parada y de alimentación, por ejemplo, para especies migratorias como, como los flamencos. Tenemos las, las, las turberas o la Reserva Nacional Pacaya Samiria como una fuente muy grande de alimento, de proteína para alimentación humana. Este, tenemos también este, to, todo lo que está vinculado a los manglares en, en la costa con especies de fauna muy importantes como el cocodrilo de Tumbes, incluso representado aquí en esta moneda conmemorativa que hemos sacado en los últimos años aquí, aquí en el Perú. ¿Cuáles son los beneficios que, 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 la, que las turberas ofrecen a la, a la población y, y, en, y en qué medida nosotros reconocemos que a los ecosistemas como bienes públicos eh, eh, a, a nivel nacional? Entonces, bienes factibles de recibir inversión pública y de recibir inversión privada. Proveen bienes y servicios claves para la gente, especialmente para comunidades que están, eh, que hacen utilización de, de, de sus recursos este, en la zona andina, en la zona costera, en la zona amazónica. Son parte, o sea, son una parte fundamental en la generación de la identidad y de la cultura de estas, de estas poblaciones locales. Mantienen... Eh, una serie de servicios ecosistémicos que son sumamente importantes y lo vamos a ver después, no solo a nivel local, sino a nivel nacional e incluso a nivel global. Y además, y, es, y esto es algo que se ha quedado, ha quedado muy claro en términos de, 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 de la situación actual que estamos viviendo con la COVID-19, son un lugar muy, muy importante para mantener agua, agua de calidad suficiente y para, para asegurar eh, cierto nivel de inmunización frente a zoonosis y frente a pandemias que pudieran existir hacia el futuro. Otro de estos servicios ecosistémicos es el tema del almacenamiento de carbono. Nuestras turberas almacenan eh, solamente las que están estas en la, en la cuenca del Pastaza Marañón, que son una de las, nuestras zonas de turberas en el ámbito amazónico, 60 años de emisiones este, concentradas de, de, de todo el país, a, solamente a nivel de esta extensión de, de cerca de 3 millones, este, de, de 5 millones de, 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 de hectáreas que tenemos en este, en este lugar. Y eso que la medición que se ha hecho en este caso solamente eh, incluye las raíces y la, y la, y la cobertura este, de hojas eh, por encima del suelo. No hemos medido turba, por ejemplo, y lo que uno ve, por ejemplo, en este gráfico es que esa capacidad de, 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 de almacenar carbono podría ser aún mucho más grande, ¿no? Y, y, y nuevamente necesitamos poder profundizar mucho en el tema de investigación y ahí hay una política eh, pública que está siendo promovida muy, muy fuertemente respecto a poder determinar este, este servicio ecosistémico que brindan las turberas. Por ejemplo, existe una, una, un vínculo extremadamente fuerte entre las turberas andinas y la cultura, la cultura local, o sea, el desarrollo de la civilización en los Andes eh, es un, un, un desarrollo alrededor de una gestión adecuada de los recursos hídricos. Recordemos que en el caso del, del, del Perú se, 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 se genera este, este corte entre los Andes más tropicales y más húmedos que ocurren entre Ecuador, Colombia y Venezuela y los Andes más secos que empiezan en Perú y siguen hacia Chile y Argentina. Entonces, el factor de gestión del recurso hídrico y por tanto los humedales y las turberas que, que, que son eh, una, una parte fundamental en, en, en la regulación del, 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 del ciclo hídrico son, como digo, parte fundamental, una, una base, un, un, un building block del, del desarrollo cultural andino, ¿no? Que, que es tan, tan, tan reconocido a, a nivel mundial este, respecto, respecto del, del, del Perú, respecto de los países andinos. Y en el ámbito amazónico, 
los aguajales, que son esta, esta especie dominante, la mauricia flexuosa, su nombre científico, en, en, en estos pantanos de palmeras, también ha sido un eh, determinante en la conformación de la identidad cultural amazónica este, local, siendo un eh, lugar de abastecimiento de fruto, de generación de toda una serie de, de, de contribuciones de la naturaleza que son sumamente importantes para, para el mantenimiento de estas poblaciones locales. Pero las turberas eh, un poco también o sea, están en riesgo, porque hay proyectos de desarrollo, porque hay ideas, eh, un poco tiene que ver eso con, con la poca información, o la, la, la relativa poca información que se maneja respecto de su importancia, eh, sobre, sobre qué, ta, qué, tan, qué tanto riesgo implica transformar las turberas o destruirlas. ¿no? Por ejemplo, aquí estamos mostrando el ejemplo de una carretera que es propuesta por un gobierno regional para conectar el ámbito amazónico con la zona costera del Perú y que, y que lo que vemos es que si esta carretera propuesta se construye, podría implicar que, 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 que tengamos dificultad para cumplir con nuestros compromisos de las NDCs. El cálculo que hemos hecho aquí, por ejemplo, es que no construir la carretera podría permitirnos eh, un cumplimiento de alrededor del 15% de nuestra, de nuestra NDC vinculada a reducir las emisiones eh, asociadas a, 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 a LULUCIEP, ¿no? a pérdida de bosques y, y, y deforestación. Entonces, de ese nivel de importancia estamos hablando en términos de la conservación y del mantenimiento de estos tipos de ecosistemas. ¿no? O sea, esa, esa capacidad de influir o de generar... Este, cambios grandes en términos del cumplimiento de metas internacionales que estamos. Y frente a esos, esas amenazas, nosotros estamos promoviendo un nuevo modelo de negocio. O sea, ¿Cómo un nuevo modelo de intervención? ¿Cómo promovemos la utilización sostenible de, los, de, de las turberas tal como son? O sea, manteniéndolas húmedas, mant o sea, aprovechando los recursos que las mismas turberas generan. Y este es el caso de, un, de, un, de una eh, iniciativa que venimos impulsando con apoyo de una corporación privada, de un, de un este, AGE, que es una, una corporación que tiene presencia en 20 países del mundo, es una empresa productora de bebidas, que está trabajando muy de cerca con nuestro servicio de áreas protegidas, con las comunidades que viven en la zona de amortiguamiento de la Reserva Nacional Pacaya Samiria, y que están aprovechando un fruto de palmera, un fruto de, de uso tradicional, que proviene de un área protegida y que está permitiendo generar un producto que, que, que ha elevado el nivel de ingreso de las poblaciones locales, ha permitido hacer una estabilización del precio que tenía este, este producto o este fruto a, a lo largo del año y ha permitido una alianza de trabajo entre Estado, comunidades locales y el sector privado y organizaciones de sociedad civil, eh, todos eh, en un mismo objetivo. ¿Cómo demostrar que las áreas protegidas son eh, tierra productiva, no son tierra ociosa, son tierra en la cual se produce de forma sostenible para generar y abastecer mercado. Aquí está un poco más de información sobre el impacto sobre la zona de intervención, que es un poco el modelo que estamos impulsando para todas nuestras áreas protegidas y especialmente para nuestras áreas protegidas que tienen turberas en las cuales la importancia de estos eh, bienes y servicios que se generan es claramente evidente, ¿no? O sea, es, es más clara tal vez que en otros tipos de áreas de áreas protegidas que tenemos en el país. ¿Cuál es el modelo que estamos promoviendo desde el país? La conservación y puesta en valor de los humedales en general y las turberas dentro de las áreas protegidas, dentro de los sitios Ramsar y en general como, como ecosistemas de importancia para la provisión de servicios ecosistémicos de contribuciones de la naturaleza. La, el reconocimiento de estos servicios a través de los pagos por servicios ecosistémicos, lo que las, llamamos nosotros mecanismos de retribución, en la recuperación de las turberas que se han perdido, sobre todo en la zona andina, donde hemos tenido procesos de degradación, procesos de pérdida por uso intensivo, y, y, y finalmente lo que señalaba al principio, la identificación de las zonas de turbera para ver dónde están y qué es este, lo que necesitamos trabajar de manera más profunda. Muchas gracias a todos por su atención y disculpen si me tomé más del tiempo debido. Gracias. No, thank you so much. An extraordinary way to close out this phenomenal session. Um, we had uh, received many, many very good questions. And uh, while we don't have time to go back to the speakers to have them answer it now, we will provide information uh, on these responses to these questions in, um, in the app, in the WhatsApp app 
um, that you can find after this session. Um, really great questions about wanting to know the difference between carbon sequestration and peatlands compared to other very, very intensive uh, mm -hmm. ecosystems like uh, forest land and mangroves. Questions about um, how do you ensure conservation in the light of pressures for deforestation due to oil palm. Um, ideas about how there can be more collaboration, for example, between uh, the Republic of Congo and Indonesia. Um, and then also more about uh, things like what maps currently exist for peatland carbon that, uh, on storage that could exist. Um, and what are some of the perspectives of local community in terms of the opportunities around peatlands. Uh, I just wanna thank the speech speakers for such valuable contributions. We started out by understanding how important uh, these ecosystems are, um, how beautiful they are, and also how what the incredible services that they provide for humanity in terms of health, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of climate. We heard them described as the perfect system because of what they're capable of doing both for resilience for communities and flood protection and water stability, but also the magnitude, incredible magnitude of the examples from Peru and Argentina about um, the uh, mitigation potential. Um, we've heard very positive examples. We heard uh, national actions as well as scientific information that is there to be the foundation for future actions, the need for more actions, the need for local buy-in and how important it is to connect this to livelihoods um, in addition to the high level buy-in to really ensure that we have a full understanding of the historic connections uh, to cultures and to human well-being. Um, and I would say there, that was one of the real themes we heard from multiple speakers was about the connectivity. Um, since the first compelling uh, information that we heard from uh, the CMS Executive Secretary about connecting ecosystems, but also connecting people. Thank you so much for all the contributions and for participating in this, in this wonderful journey around the world on the importance of, uh, of peatlands. And we look forward to uh, connecting with you more, including Wild for Life on the peatlands journey. Thank you.